bit of a case study and talk about a little bit about what we did and where the problems are. And I'm hoping that a lot of the questions that I've heard just come up are going to be answered by the time I'm done. So first things first, we had to roll out IPv6 on our own network. And I'm not just talking about v6 announcements at an IXP, right? We actually had to get v6 working on our own network end to end. That's what a lot of people forget. They want to take it to the customers first, but you first got to stabilize your network. We run ISIS. Here's something about engineers. Engineers are typically kind of lazy, and if they can connect something to the point where it's working for what they need, it kind of stops. If you run ISIS, however, you can enforce single topology. That means that when the guy plugs in the next router into the network, if he doesn't configure his V6 on his point-to-points and his loopbacks, it will not sync to the IGP. It won't work. That enforces V6 on the network. It means that the V6 has to be done. If you're running OSPF and you've got to run out OSPF and then OSPF3, guess what? The engineer is probably not going to bother with the OSPF3 until somebody goes, hey, why didn't you? So I think that that single topology really ensures that things actually get done. Um, we made mistakes when we started, like taking all our point-to-points out of a single slash 64. Big, big mistake and something that to this day, we are still trying to change. Now, 1 slash 127 out of a separate slash 64 at every point. Um, there were various reasons for that, security reasons, um, deployment reasons, etc. I'm not going to go into all the technical details, but don't take all your point to points out of 1 slash 64. It's just, I know that there are loads of them in a slash 64, but you will regret it later. Um, we had to run V6 on the P layer. LDP6 didn't exist when we started this, nor did segment routing. It's again something that we are still fixing today. And I blame the vendors and I blame the IETF for this. Why 20 years after the protocol came, when the world is running MPLS, is the MPLS support for V6 as bad as it is? That I really, really have a major fight with the vendors about. And I know that I've got certain vendors on the webcast watching this presentation. Hear my message. Fix your V6 MPLS. We want to know why providers are not deploying this to the edge. Because provider networks today run MPLS. And if you don't have good support for V6 in MPLS, it's not going to happen. And whether or not we like MPLS, and I know there are people in this room that really don't like MPLS, that's just reality. Yes, I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, you know, and also, when we start talking about things like the more advanced technologies, BGP labeled unicast, for example, again, carrying labels for V6 over BGP labeled unicast, there's a bit of a problem. It all comes down to the MPLS side of things. But basically, getting the V6 onto the core was not as simple as it seemed. We eventually succeeded using a lot of workarounds. V6 unlabeled, V4 labeled, um, V6 full table on our P layer, which runs BGP free on V4. Um, you know, a couple of things like that. That is starting to change because LDP6 is now there, segment routing is now there, um, well dependent on the vendor, but it's something that is really, really important. If you're going to do this, you've got to take this into account and you've got to plan the time for it. Now, then we went and we said, okay, IP transit customers get V6 first. They're easy. Thanks, Mark. He pushed one of our customers really hard to take V6 from us, so we gave the customer V6. Had a lot of motivation with the customer and Mark kind of kicking. Um, but really, it's really, really simple to turn up V6 to a transit customer. You turn up the PGP session. Then we had to make a decision, where do we go next? The mass market 
consumers, the enterprise, our own internal services. Our own internal services we could run in parallel, right? But that mass market versus the enterprise. Take the quick wing, the mass market, the consumer, the home user. Why? Because I can turn up V6 to my home users without them having to do anything. They don't even need to know they're running it. I push it out to the CPEs, I delegate the prefixes, it goes out onto their LAN interfaces, the RA kicks in, they get V6, they start using it. When we rolled out our V6 in Zimbabwe, we've now got 23, 24,000 V6 active users doing 40% of the traffic into the network on V6, and you know what? Didn't have to tell the customers a damn thing just turned it on and they started using it. There was no budget involved, there was no massive support calls, just turned it on and it worked. The enterprise, they got firewalls. I can route all the V6 I like to them. If they're not gonna pick it up and do something with it, it ain't gonna work. So the enterprise, we're starting to work really closely to figure out how to do that. We're in the process of creation, creating some white papers to push out to the enterprise. We're gonna be doing some webcasts and some video feeds, etc. Putting a line on your web page though that says I offer it, you know what, they're probably not gonna see it. They're not gonna notice it. You've gotta actually take an active effort to push it out. That also means training your sales teams. Because us technical people, we can know all the, all Nobody has ever seen that video on YouTube. Just Google the front fell off. Not while I'm talking, though. <laughs> um, the CPEs had to be cheap. It's a requirement for mass market. We needed TR69 support because if you're doing mass CPEs, TR69 is pretty important. And the CPEs on the GPON network, well, ONTs are kind of locked to OLTs, so time to talk to the vendor when they start breaking. Um, Almost every CPE we tested had issues. Almost every single one of them. The ONTs from Alcatel didn't initially support V6 and man was it a headache trying to get that out of them. We eventually did though. Um, the Mikrotix had good V6 but no TR69 and before anyone tells me that they're promising TR69 they've been promising TR69 for about 10 years. Um, have they, now, have they now finally got it? Well, that, that's good news. Um, months and months and months. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good thing. Um, the D-Link V6 had fantastic V6 support. There's only one problem. When you enable V6, their firewall automatically blocks it all. So it'll give it to you, but it's, well, hard block. And try and explain to a customer how to disable his firewall. Good luck. Um, the TP-Links require open WRT and when you're rolling out 100 or 200 devices a week trying to reload the operating system on the damn device before you deploy it, that ain't gonna happen. The Fritz box supported the V6 great. There's only one problem. Um, it's made in Germany and they haven't quite got their English interface working. So you kind of get this interface that's half German and half English even when you put it on the English setting that doesn't work so well either. Interestingly enough, let me get to the Howie ONTs. That stuff just worked. I don't say much good about Howie normally, but that, their stuff was fantastic. Plugged it in, turned it on, no problems. It just worked. So my congratulations to Howie on that. Don't worry, Howie, I'll get to the other problems just now. Um, but yeah, that, that's on the CPE side. Then we rolled it out. Great. We've now got 20 something thousand in Zimbabwe and it's out there. So our current st status. We're still deploying Mikrotik CPEs on the Metro broadband. This is where we're not doing FTDH. It's connected into the Metro network and we take it back via cross connects, get a PPPoE, etc. But we're still Looking for other alternatives, we're still using the Mikrotex, but we're always on the lookout. We've got V6 on the ONTs, 
Now, how is in the Alcatels both tested, both <coughs> working? Um, the BRASLAS, Cisco, and Howie, no problem. We're introducing Juniper BNGs in the next week or two, and in fact, my licenses for my Juniper BNGs actually arrived this morning. Thank you, David. Um, We've got 1,048 allocated and active in Kenya, and we've got over 20,000 in Zimbabwe. And this stuff is just working. The customers don't even know that it's there. Now we're also testing virtual CPEs, though. How do you solve the problem with your CPEs? So a lesson about ISPs and deploying CPEs at customers, particularly home users. We all give our customers these CPEs, and then the customer leaves. And you know what? How many of you ever bother to recover your CPEs um, with any success? Uh, how much money are we throwing away by, you know, giving away CPEs? So, how about I just take a straight bridge, a wireless bridge, and I put that down at the customer. And then I cross-connect it back to a virtualized CPE, be it a VSRX or whatever it is and do all my CPE functionality in the cloud. That means I'm controlling the CPE, I can do the V6, I can handle problems with the firewalls, etc., and the customer churns, guess what, I just reallocate the vCPE license. That means I don't have to worry about hardware lying at customers and wasting capex, and I get to do my V6 because I control the CPE, and it's not the customer introducing God knows what onto my network that may or may not support it. So that is something that we are actively exploring at, at the moment, um, which I think will take us a long, long way. And interestingly enough, even with the enterprise customers, why have the customer running a router on the premises? If you pull it back and you're in control of that gear, you've got the functionality to ensure that he's got the V6 and it saves you money. So that is something that really, I think, could really, really help. Now, our next steps. We're about to start rolling out another network. I'm not going to say where, but it's a big network. And it's green fields. So we're going to do this differently. Every time we roll out a new network, we try and push the bounds. And then have the rest of the network catch up afterwards. Um, we're rolling segment routing um, in production. That means labeled V6 across the network on the node SIDs in the segment routing. If you don't know about segment routing today, do your homework. Segment routing is the future. It's a thing of beauty. Um, but that means that we will have labeled V6 on that network. No more V6 full table needed in P routers, etc., because I can label switch it through, um, and I'll be able to do layer 2 bindings of my cross connects on V6 over the segment routing. Effectively, it means that on my network there, I won't need V4. The customer can get his V4, but the V4 is switched over V6 LSPs. I can eliminate V4 loopbacks. I can eliminate V4 point to point. That's going to save me money in the long term because of the cost of running V4. And so that's where we're moving towards. From our perspective, I don't want V4 on my network anymore. I need it to provide it to my customers. But beyond that, for my own infrastructure, why? Why am I going to keep running two address families two protocols, more troubleshooting, all the rest of it. So that segment routing is key to what we're doing. And I've got one of my partners in the room at the moment. He's sitting over there in the red shirt. And he'll tell you just how hard I've been kicking the vendors on this every single day. And that is key. Because if you don't have a good relationship with your vendors and your partners in doing this, you could run into a problem. Because V4's had 20 years, 20 years to develop. V6, we're in early days. You're going to hit problems. I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you and tell you this is going to be easy. But the better relationship you have with your vendors 
to work through those problems, the easier it's going to be. Um, we're also attempting now, as I said, to push V4 over the V6. If that means me putting an external controller running something like Exit BGP to form my LSPs to do it, so be it. I'll do that. But it means sometimes running fairly recent code. Um, in 17.3 R1 and Junos, which was only released on Friday last week, I've got that running in certain places right now. Why? Because it can do V4 over V6. And so there's active testing there. However, as much as I've said good things about Juniper, Cisco is currently the only vendor at the moment that supports V6 binding of Martini Cross Connects. Juniper's told me hopefully four to six months on that, but I'm kicking really hard. The LDP SR mapping, at the moment, that's coming in 17.4 on Junos. I'm playing with an alpha version at the moment of it. Why is it only sitting in one vendor though when we need it? Because Howie, I mean Cisco, sorry, decided to pass a patent on it. Cisco has a habit of passing patents on things put through the IETF and it delays things. And my message to Cisco is stop it. You're causing me problems. But at the same time, when I look at roadmaps of other vendors with regards to V6 and stuff like segment routing, on the Howie stuff, some of the stuff is only scheduled for 2019. That's a problem. You are experiencing a feature lag on the vendors dependent on the markets they're catering towards. The only way to solve this is for us as ISPs to put that pressure constantly. And if a vendor can't supply it, buy another vendor and then tell the previous vendor that you bought them. And tell them why. The day that you talk with your wallet and walk away, that's the day they will change. Believe me, it works. But I'm telling you now that you've got to start talking with your wallets in your purchasing decisions on V6 because this is going to affect you. It's going to cost you money. Keep in mind, at the moment, our V4 burn rate at the moment, luckily we still have a fair amount of it, but I'm burning anywhere at some months up to a slash 17 in three weeks. Let me tell you what the secondary market pricing on a slash 17 is. Almost half a million dollars. That means that if I run out of V4 and I've got to go to the secondary market because our friends at Afrinic have run out of V4 too or won't give it to me for whatever reason, um, I'm going to have to be buying space at a potential OPEX cost because I can't asset IP addresses of half a million dollars a month. Six million dollars a year. Who can afford that? We can't. I mean, maybe the mobile providers with their data, you know, charges can, but not me, you know what I mean? So V6 becomes very, 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 very important because it's going to cost you money. You have to get that to your vendors and you've got to hammer it home. And more to the point, you've got to hammer it home internally in your companies because your engineers are going to fight this. It's more work. They're going to fight you. But if you want the management to put the pressure, you've got to make the financial case. And there is a financial case and it's a big one. So work with the vendors, vote with your wallets if they can't support it. As I said, there's the announcement of the V6. We're also still working on the V6 over BGP because it's necessary for the labeled unicast. It's coming in the new network as well. We're busy testing. Um, we're moving away from V4 traffic engineering. Build out TE tunnels over V6 LSPs and then push the V6 over it. Again, every single point here that you will see is about not dual stacking anymore. Dual stack, that's yesterday. It's time to get rid of V4. V4 is dying. And in many parts of the world, it's dead. Rogers, Canada today, 50, 60 million cell phone users who do not get V4 addresses. 
It's translated to V4 where they need it, but it's a V6 only deployment on the cell phones. Go to Canada, turn on your phone, you'll only get a V6 address. That is where we need to be. Um, we are testing that translation, the NAT64, the 464 XLAT stuff. Um, I plan to be bugging Jan a hell of a lot in the future about that because he knows it probably better than most. Um, but, you know, our point is we've managed to get it this far. We've pushed Zimbabwe to 7-8% of their total combined traffic into the country to V6. They're the only country on the continent that's turned green at the moment. We had some advantages there because we were pushing out over FTDH on a platform that really easily supported this. We've got to target the enterprise, but we've also got to ensure that our network is ready for the future and we've got to solve the issues of the fact that the vendors and the IETF have not put enough work into what is critical to providers, MPLS. We stand here and we talk about V6 and we ask why aren't providers rolling this? Why? Because we are not talking about what's important, MPLS. Look at what providers run their networks on. L3 VPNs, L2 VPNs, all of the packet switching. Um, it's all label switched, it's all MPLS. That has lagged behind by years. And my message as well to everybody who's promoting V6, if you don't start talking the MPLS language, you're going to miss a lot of providers because it's going to scare them, particularly the bigger ones, because MPLS is reality, accept it. And anybody who tells me segment routing isn't MPLS, well, you're confused because it is. It's just an extension. Um, you know, so start talking in those terms because it's important. And then final thoughts. Getting rid of V4 is going to require some innovation. It's happening in the mobile world to a degree. AT&T, Rogers, some of the big players are getting rid of V4 because they don't have enough. But on the fixed line telco, on the FTDH, on the home user, sometimes that requires a bit of adjustment. I don't ever want to hear anybody say to me, but my vendor couldn't do it. Because we found that you can innovate around what your vendors can and can't do. And you can also pressure your vendors and if they still won't deliver it, you go to another vendor. But it has to happen. And keep in mind, in this industry, if we don't innovate, we die. Because the margins are dropping and you've got to be able to differentiate yourself. And what better way to differentiate yourself than say, my network is ready for the future. When some website goes V6 only, my customers will be able to get there. Will your current ISP's customers be able to get there? Probably not, because they're not ready. So you have to innovate and you've got to push your vendors. And it's got to be about getting rid of V4, not just dual stacking it anymore, because it's too late for that. The V4 is coming to an end. And then what are you going to do? As I said, MPLS is part of our lives. You've got to prepare your V6 networks to work with it. And to the vendors, to Juniper, to Cisco, to Howie, to all my big vendors who are my partners, I love all you guys, but please, this is important. It's going to cost me money if you don't get it right. Um, as I said, the vendors are lagging. There's a huge feature lag. I've seen one particular feature that I'm rolling on certain vendors today that showed up in another vendor's route map, um, roadmap for 2019. No, I can't buy that. And they're like, oh, but that's our company's strategy. I don't care. It doesn't fit with my strategy. I'm going elsewhere. You know, either accelerate it or lose the business. It has to be because I'm not going to damage our future prospects waiting for a vendor. Um, and as I say, a close working relationship with the vendors. I'm pushing the boundaries on alpha and beta code to get this working, not in production, but in labs. So that the day that it does become ready, I'm pushing it into the network because it's tested and it's out there. I know that some of the vendors have beta programs that you can sign up for if you are a customer. They'll give it to you as a beta. You're not supposed to put it in production, but you can test it. At least start getting 
getting the work done and allocate the man hours to the staff to allow people to do it. It's always a problem. The budget, not so much. The man hours to the staff, that's important. Um, and never, ever accept no from a vendor. Because if your current vendor is saying no, his competition is saying yes. If your vendor says no, you walk. And the moment that you do it once, just once, I promise you it'll never happen again. Because a lot of the vendors will sit there and go, you're bluffing. Uh, I don't... I think you said earlier on that you're going to have a fight with mime cost. Yes. I think there are other vendors that do IPv6 mail just as well as them that you could just as easily switch to. The BRAS to the CPE point to point. And then we push a 48 down to the customer's device with the HCP PD, and that's the static part of it, the 48 static. So you, you're issuing your point to points out of 1 slash 48? Yes, but 64. In, but you're actually only allocating, uh, or for that point to point linker 127 out uh, of 164. Yes. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, Jan George, Internet Society. No, it's it's not the question that, that you're expecting. It's I know, that's what's scaring me. <laughs> it's something else. No, I'm, I'm really interested. Yes, you mentioned the virtual CPEs, right? And I'm, I'm really in, interested in, did you do any, any testing of, of how IPv6 neighbor discovery and Slack works over long range lossy links and then you have a bunch of computers on the other side and then array packets flowing around and multicast and things like this. Does it work properly? It or works perfectly in an MPLS environment, Jan. Because was, I'm creating virtual <laughs> Ethernet circuits and it works perfectly. <laughs> if I were trying to do this without any MPLS back end, no, it wouldn't work. <laughs> Can you be serious for a microsecond? <laughs> <laughs> I am being serious. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right. The, 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 no, the, the reality is, is that the connection from the virtual CPE to the customer is an Ethernet link, right? It's a stock standard Ethernet link from the perspective of the virtual CPE and the customer because it's built over MPLS. If I were to try to do this without MPLS, it wouldn't work. So yes, um, it is a stock standard Ethernet link and it just works. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks very much, and I hope that was.